All right. Well, hello again, and welcome to today's webinar, uh, Reframing the Story, Investment in Black Men and Boys is Vital to Whole Community Health. Uh, we're getting started now. Uh, so again, thank you for joining us. Uh, for those of you who are returning Foundation Center webinar participants, a warm welcome back. And to those of you uh, that are here for the first time, I'm so glad that you're joining us today. Uh, my name is Julieta Mendez, and I am the uh, Director of Programs for Foundation Center. Uh, and I'm also joined by my colleague, Elizabeth Zavada, uh, who is our Programs Associate, and she will be supporting today's webinar by managing polls, as well as collecting questions that you ask along the way uh, and posing them during the Q&A. So just kind of letting you know who is uh, here behind the behind the um, backstage uh, and uh, that you will be uh, very well taken care of today. Now I would like to take a moment to introduce today's presenters. Moderating alongside me during today's conversation, we have Dorian Burton, who's Chief Program Officer at Keenan Charitable Trust and Chief Strategist at Tandem Ed an organization that provides capacity building services focused on race and equity and rooted in community-based leadership. On our panel, we also have Dr. Brian Barnes, co-founder of Tandem Ed, Sean Dove, who is the CEO of the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, a membership organization dedicated to ensuring the growth, sustainability, and impact of leaders and organizations focus on improving the life outcomes of America's black men and boys. And joining them are Travion uh, Shorter, who is the CEO of um, BME Community, an award-winning network of community builders known for defining people by their positive contributions to society. And then last but definitely not least, Anthony Smith, who leads Cities United as its first CEO. Welcome everyone. Welcome to this amazing panel that uh, we have here uh, today. Thank you so much uh, for joining us in what is our fourth webinar that is part of our series uh, titled All Together Now Conversations in Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. This is a series that we kicked off in June thanks to the generous support of Borealis Philanthropy. And with that, I'm going to be handing it over to Dorian to get, to get the conversation started. Dorian? Thank you to Foundation Center for allowing us with the opportunity and the platform uh, to have this conversation today. Um, I think you guys are in for a real treat uh, with uh, with the panel that we have. Um, I also believe that you know as we as we talk today, um, I want you guys to really hold you know that our country is at a critical crossroads, um, and the quality of uh, what we do in our present uh, with systems and investments in communities is going to be very uh, is going to dictate the quality of our future. Uh, we believe that. Uh, black males um, and investment in black males is vital uh, to whole community health. Um, and so want to make sure that you, as, and as we speak um, through today, you hear from the panelists, um, that you think about uh, your own interactions uh, within communities of color, uh, your own investments within communities of color, um, how your organizations uh, can ad adapt some of these principles or continue if they already are doing them, uh, to continue to move uh, and scale uh, this work um, because it's critically vital to uh, to to the space uh, and to our communities as a whole. I won't take too much more time, but want to hop into uh, our first uh, our first question with Dr. Brian Barnes um, and really kind of thinking about helping us to kind of paint that landscape of what have some of the barriers been to creating systems level impact for communities of color, um, Brian. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Dorian, and thanks to the Foundation Center again for uh, hosting this uh, conversation. Um, so I want to start off by saying that there are many uh, barriers uh, to creating systems level impact in communities of color, but want to take this time just to highlight uh, one that uh, seems the most pressing and, and pointed for black communities, and that is um, what I find to be unwillingness or inability for uh, philanthropy or nonprofits to challenge the status quo, particularly through investing in community-led action. And what I mean by that is uh, action that is uh, led by, in this case, the black communities, uh, own leadership strategies, action, narratives, uh, and really is self-determining uh, and challenging the status quo. 
And I want to just contrast that with, with what I see as sort of business as usual investment uh, in programs and activities that are really about uh, black communities and black boys uh, subduing their identity, uh, their collective purpose in order to fit in sort of a uh, American dominant culture and institutions. And so I want to just sort of uh, move on that theme uh, for the comments here and illustrate uh, what I'm getting at through some of my own personal anecdotes. Uh, so, so one, just want to share um, a narrative of, of me sort of growing up in Huntsville, Alabama in the 80s and 90s. And, and one story that stands out uh, as a high school student, I went to a school that appeared uh, integrated from the outside, but once you sort of delved into the, the school itself, you found it was very segregated, black and white. Most of the black students were in the uh, general ed, regular ed courses, while most of the white students were placed in uh, advanced AP and some of the magnet programs. And I was one of the few black students that sort of traversed both uh, terrains. And one day in uh, uh, 12th grade uh, advanced placement English class, I just finished a speech. And um, the teacher was an older white female. She sort of signaled to me, hey, I'd like to talk with you after class. Um, and you know, in a very, like, a supportive tone, wanted, wanted to be supportive and helpful to me in my development, and pulled me aside and said, hey, you know, Brian, I think we need to work on you getting the black out of your voice. Now, contrast that with uh, me also in Alabama enrolling in summer programs at the local historically black college, Alabama A&M, and being around black professors, black college students, and being told the opposite your voice and your likeness is beautiful and brilliant as a, a black boy, um, you know, being exposed to algebra by fourth grade, which eventually led me to be a mathematics major in, uh, at Morehouse College. And, and they're just sort of being instilled with the idea that blackness is beautiful, um, there is a purpose and goal for your education that's aligned with our community's expectations. But the difference is that that latter program um, was not likely to be uh, funded uh, in a way that would allow more than a few of the city's youth to be involved in it, though. Uh, but it was a very community-based, community-led sort of orientation that really built up um, the black leadership that uh, we needed in that community. And this is not just my own personal uh, experience. This is also what I observed in my career, particularly in the area of education, which I want to use as a sort of uh, uh, illustration. Uh, I was a teacher, math teacher, prince, uh, principal of a small school, led some district work around community-based partnerships and sat on uh, collective impact initiatives. And what I witnessed was sort of the same theme, was most of the organizations and institutions um, that were uh, leading the work in education or that were getting the most investments were uh, led and governed by people who were not part of the daily lives of the communities of the students. Um, but they would still sort of situate themselves as being the, you know, the quote unquote hub of the community. And at the most, uh, what would happen is they would, you know, involve, quote unquote, involve the parents in the com and community. But it would be really about supporting an agenda and approach that they had already uh, decided upon. And where you had youth, parents, and communities who disrupted that paradigm and said no, you know, we are the leaders of our own education, our own communities, and your role is to align to us. Those were the ones that were quickly labeled as troublemakers, agitators, and overstepping their bounds. And so at the end of the day, I, I think, and again, still using education as a, an example, I think that at the end of the day, the youth, uh, the black boys and girls were the ones that suffered the most because there's a lot of evidence, just motivational theory and other engagement theory that, you know, when uh, the purposes and goals are not also um, backed up by the people who are, who you are around the most, your community. You won't, you you most likely won't be involved. This is not me just talking. I mean, there's a lot of scholarly uh, work to to back that up. Look at Young Gifted and Black from uh, Perry, Claude Steele, and Asa Hilliard. You know, they would talk about schooling for work. The narrative is often pushed by institutions. Um, that are led by people outside their communities, it's not enough uh, to really motivate uh, students. Um, and so on the other hand, what we really want to see and what we know is that that there has been leadership, there always has been leadership around education that comes from communities, families, churches, barbershops, social protest groups, and music, 
Um, that's, I'm, and I'm drawing that from some of the work of Peg, Peck and Douglas with education by any means necessary. Um, but we've always known that there is um, the leadership, we just don't typically invest in it or align to it. And so just to sort of summarize this point, I um, want to use a couple of diagrams um, in the slide and say that this, this trend translates beyond just education. I think this is the same paradigm that actually we talk about health, talking about investments in workforce development. Typically what we find is a situation where there are institutions, organizations, collective impact initiatives that sort of sit in the center of the community, but not but are governed and led by people not from those communities. And we look to them to be the leaders of a lot of the key critical components of community development. And at the most, um, what we find is that we ask them to, quote unquote, engage the community. So what we're asking them to uh, engage the community as the community, the youth, the families, and students somewhat in that paradigm sit outside of the work that they're doing. Uh, which is a very deficit-based approach to investing and working with our, our, our communities. Um, but what we really want to see is the reverse, where uh, communities, youth, families, and residents are sitting at the center uh, of the, the key critical component, components of their own development, and where you have programs, philanthropies, and other investors really asking the question of how can they align themselves uh, to the leadership that is coming from the people who uh, sit at the center uh, of the work. And so we shouldn't see philanthropies and uh, nonprofits in this particular situation shying away from uh, uh, investments that may seem to go against the grain. You know, investing in uh, black boys and black girls that are looking to build their own industries and, and own their own property as opposed to only thinking about preparing themselves to work for individuals that are not part of their community. Um, investments and programs where they, they're leading their own narrative and their own news, where they are building their own centers of education. Uh, these are the ways that we, we invest in ways that uh, challenge the status quo. And really there's a moral mandate there as I close to uh, ensure that we are taking um, uh, the historical context in play and correcting the harm that has been done to so many of our communities historically. So I think that's the, the, the key barrier that I want to highlight in terms of creating system level impact in communities of color. Thanks. All right, thank you so much for that. We're going to be launching our first poll today, or actually, I'm sorry, you will not be seeing a poll uh, pop up on your screen. We just ask that you respond to this question here. And that is, what are your personal feelings around justice-related investments? So some of the some of the responses that we're seeing so far is there is not enough being done, uh, much needed but not well done. We we're getting here some sense of uh, skepticism, uh, skeptical that uh, we will be listened to. People feel that uh, this conversation is a must, uh, and we have a lot more responses coming in. Uh, Justice-related investments produce return not only to the people directly involved, but also spills out into communities producing broad change and improvement. Thank you, Tammy, for your response. Uh, people are saying it's essential. So what, what are your thoughts on, on some of these responses, uh, Dorian? So I, I think one, um, you'll see, uh, you know, from some of the audience feedback, I think I, uh, Brian did an excellent job really being able to talk about what the current landscape uh, the current landscape is. And as we tend to reform uh, or map reforms onto communities as opposed to having communities at the center, um, but also that, um, you know, we ask communities very regularly uh, from a philanthropic standpoint to come to our tables uh, as opposed to going to find the work, find the individuals that are already doing this work. And oftentimes have been doing this work for a, a very long time uh, just per perhaps on a resource um, uh, and asking them uh, what they want to do uh, and asking them, can we come to their table um, and really starting to build um, uh, capacity around community to be the heroes and the heroines of their own stories. Um, so I think these questions, uh, some of the feedback is, is spot on. Um, and I appreciate Brian really being able to set that context. From now, I want to move on to Sean Dove from the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. Um, and ask uh, a question that's really twofold. Uh, one is, 
why make the investment in black males, specifically in black male, uh, black male achievement um, in communities of color? Um, and second, what does the current philanthropic landscape look like? I think when, um, when you're looking at the space, people try to use a lot of buzzwords that get around issues around race. Um, and so uh, I think this question is critical. Um, Sean, you've been in the space uh, as a practitioner, uh, as, uh, as a philanthropist, um, uh, and now currently uh, as uh, really driving this work uh, on the ground from a campaign level. Um, and so if you can hop into those two questions, that would be great. Great. Thanks, Dorian, uh, for uh, organizing this. I want to thank the Foundation uh, Center, uh, who has been a long partner with the campaign for Black Male Achievement. Uh, back in 2013, we launched uh, in partnership with them, uh, BMA funders, to help elevate attention and uh, grant-making activity in the philanthropic sector around explicit investments in uh, uh, black men and boys uh, in this country. And, you know, uh, the compelling question of uh, why uh, should we invest in uh, uh, black men and boys, um, I, I really think about if we want uh, targeted outcomes, if we want targeted uh, returns on our investments, we have to make targeted uh, investments. When we look historically uh, over the years, um, investing in black communities and particularly in black led organizations that are in community as uh, Dr. Barnes has uh, really uh, done a great job laying out, uh, that calls for certainly uh, a need and um, of acting with risk, urgency, and momentum about investing um, in black men and boys and uh, such strategies. And, you know, quite frankly, we cannot leave an entire population uh, uh, behind. Uh, I think, and you'll hear from uh, Trabian on this, who uh, is a leader in this country, the heart of the process, uh, I mean, the heart of the, um, the matter is that black men and boys are assets to not only their communities, their families, uh, but to this nation. And I firmly believe uh, if uh, you invest in what you value, all right? And so the, which leads me to the conversation of the landscape of, uh, of, of philanthropy, right? And what I like about this conversation that we're having here, for me, it's rooted in the premise that the current philanthropic model uh, is not a sustainable one. Uh, I think the current philanthropic uh, model for the field of black male achievement is uh, not one that I think uh, is sustainable and that we have to look at alternative revenue models. Uh, we have to look at other ways of uh, social enterprise and generating uh, dollars uh, for our, our communities. And I think it's really also important, so when you think about the landscape, uh, well, and I'm honored to be on this call uh, with the colleagues uh, here, they're uh, such an inspiration uh, to me, but uh, I certainly would be uh, remiss if I did not lift up uh, some of the sisters, and at the risk of getting some emails and calls, why didn't you uh, say anything about me? Uh, but I think of um, the leadership in the field, when we talk about uh, the landscape, and some of the women that I would uh, certainly lift up is uh, Rhonda Bryant, who's uh, the co-director of Forward uh, uh, Promise, and is doing some uh, uh, groundbreaking investments uh, around health and uh, trauma-informed care. Uh, Susan Taylor Batten, who is the CEO of AbFi, the Association of Black Foundation uh, Executives. Maisha Simmons at Robin Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, uh, Tanya Allen at Skillman. And I lift uh, those individuals up, and I can go on and on to say that uh, there is a horde of leaders within the philanthropic sector, within institutional foundations that have taken on uh, an activist uh, a mantle within their uh, uh, foundations. Many uh, going against the grain, many raising their hands in meetings and advocating for investments in uh, Black communities when uh, there, if it wasn't for their voice, there would be uh, no other voices. Um, I'm seeing uh, a good deal of uh, partnership 
uh, recently. Uh, I would credit the Executive Alliance for um, Boys and Men of Color, um, which launched in 2013 uh, and led by Damon Hewitt. And that's a consortium of uh, about 40 foundations that have agreed to come together. And initially, it was the CEOs. And uh, I would say about half of the CEOs are still at the table. Um, and a couple of things that the Executive Alliance has really elevated when we talk about black male achievement for the field. One, they've created this National Youth Alliance and uh, uh, have brought young people and uh, have strengthened the leadership pipeline to the philanthropic uh, table. Uh, and I think their motto is, you know, nothing uh, for us without us. And they've organized philanthropy around uh, police reform and closing uh, youth uh, uh, prisons. Um, I think also what I am seeing is that uh, you really have to have an inside and outside game um, when we talk about the philanthropic landscape. You know, some people automatically go to uh, traditional institutional foundations. You know, for example, I was with the Open Society Foundation uh, for uh, seven years. But there are organizations like the uh, National Committee for uh, Responsible Philanthropy that from the outside, it has really been an agitator around issues of uh, racial justice, racial equity, and addressing uh, the power dynamics. They do webinars uh, such as uh, like the one that we are on uh, today. Uh, I would lift up the SHOT Foundation uh, for Public Education. Uh, they have a webinar next week, and the uh, title of the webinar is uh, Philanthropy So White challenging uh, structural racism as white leaders in philanthropy, and that's the audience. And I would say over the last decade, conversations like that uh, have really evolved. And as Dorian uh, mentioned earlier, uh, when we look at the political landscape of this country, we all have to take more risk. We all have to elevate the conversation of uh, race uh, and equity with more urgency. And uh, we also have to find ways to partner and uh, uh, build a uh, uh, momentum. Um, you know, with that said, um, I would um, go on and, and, and venture to say that the level of resources that are making their way to uh, organizations and, and, and leaders uh, that have really put a stake in the ground um, to advance outcomes for black men and boys, uh, the level of resources uh, does not equate to the level of activity and the level of engagement uh, uh, that uh, I shared. You know, we have a, uh, a report that we do in partnership with the Foundation uh, Center and BMA funders called Quantifying Hope, uh, which was the first report that began to disaggregate the data to look at targeted funding uh, for uh, of black men and boys. And one of the challenges with that is the data itself, uh, how rapid we are able to have foundation, the foundation and philanthropic community submit data. And so the reports are always a couple years uh, uh, behind. Uh, some of this is uh, making philanthropy more transparent in their reporting. And some of this is also uh, convincing uh, philanthropy uh, why, in fact, we're having this conversation now, the need to make targeted uh, uh, in investments. And, you know, some of the data that I would want to lift up um, before turning it over in a, a couple of minutes to uh, Travian Shorters is um, that what we see is the bulk of grant dollars uh, for explicitly designated black men and boys are programmatic dollars. Uh, uh, 59 percent in uh, the years uh, 2013 and, 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 and 2014, uh, uh, roughly 107 million dollars. More than half of that uh, went to project funding. And as folks on this call that are listening, we know the, uh, uh, the stress, uh, the lack of sustainability uh, to build and grow your organization when you are only getting project funding. Uh, the other side of that in those uh, two years, um, only 6% of that uh, went to general operating support. Another 6% of that 107 million went into building 
uh, infrastructure and, and, and capital for uh, organizations, capital infrastructure, I would venture to say we have to flip those numbers, right? Uh, I think the trust level uh, is not what it needs to be or should be or could be in leaders of color that are uh, in community and operating. And Brian alluded uh, uh, to that. And what we've seen uh, over the past decade in the philanthropic sector and how investments are uh, being directed is that uh, several years ago, there were organizations where black male achievement and investing black in black men and boys, uh, this wasn't even on their radar. But then all of a sudden there were opportunities for resources and uh, yes, we appreciate folks raising the flag and, and, and coming to the philanthropic table. But what I've seen is in communities across the country and cities across the country, um, white led organizations that have existing um, infrastructure and capacity, get the grants, and then subgrant to organizations uh, in the community that have relationship where they're unable to build uh, 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 their capacity. And so I'm encouraged by the level of leadership that I see uh, in philanthropy, but it is uh, certainly a, a fight. A couple of other things that I would lift up around the landscape uh, is that 90% of the uh, funding source are from institutional foundations, 5% uh, from corporate foundations, 4% uh, uh, from um, uh, community foundations, and another 4 uh, from operating foundations. I think we uh, in this movement have to do a better job in uh, uh, utilizing and leveraging um, individual donors, high net worth donors, uh, because our reliance on uh, institutional uh, philanthropy is not going to get the returns uh, that, uh, that that we need. Uh, moving forward, what and I Sean, would, yep. Sean, there was one thing I, I, I really want you to, to, to pause there and, and dig deep on. You know, one of the things that, I, that I've seen as I stepped into philanthropy um, was the huge kind of disparity in terms of the dollars that were spent um, on, on working with, and I think you, you talked a little bit about um, uh, general operating versus programmatic support, but if you just talk about sheer dollars, right, and so you see folks that are making $200,000, $300,000, $400,000 investments when um, we know that those investments and what it's going to actually cost to fix, I think, the problems that systems have unloaded on our communities is much more than that. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about that from a funding disparity thing or uh, part around you know, thinking about the level of investments that folks are actually making towards this, uh, and then the level of what it's going to actually take to get the job done. So, uh, um, thanks for that. And uh, I, I think of, and some folks uh, may remember the uh, Richard Mur um, Eddie Murphy uh, roar. He says, "When you're starving and you get a sortine cracker, you think that you are feasting, and this is the best meal." Uh, that you have ever had. And I bring up that analogy because on one hand, Dorian, uh, we've seen in the past decade, uh, funding trends for black men and boys uh, uh, grow from 13.4 uh, uh, million um, across the nation uh, to uh, you know over 60 uh, million a few years ago. But when you compare that to how much philanthropy uh, invest totally the billions. Uh, we still have many organizations that are literally fighting for crumbs within the philanthropic uh, uh, sector, right? So there is a vast inequity uh, around the grant amounts, uh, the trust uh, that uh, philanthropy has in investing in uh, organizations led uh, by black people. And so that, uh, and, and in fact, I think that's a good job uh, or assignment for the Foundation Center to, to do. You wanna do a report, we need to do a report uh, and we all know on this webinar, we have stories of it and we've experienced it, right? The disparities. Uh, but if you really want to do a report, um, that's a report that we should look at how philanthropy is investing uh, for same issue areas, uh, same strategies, same uh, targeted outcomes uh, versus uh, uh, 
people of color and black led organizations versus uh, other uh, organizations. And, you know, just moving forward, um, and as I turn it over to uh, uh, Travian, uh, one of the things that uh, we, and we'll hear more about this also from um, Anthony Smith and what you all are doing in Louisville in partnership is that, um, again, you know, there's an old adage that philanthropy is not going to fund the revolution, right? And we have got to uh, break uh, our addiction to, uh, phil you know, traditional philanthropy. And uh, what I am seeing are some inklings around uh, wealth building investments, um, allowing uh, organizations to partner with business, uh, social enterprise strategies that invest in the assets and the resources that are already there uh, in the uh, uh, communities. And the, the, the other thing I would uh, lift up is what we really need more of are investments in uh, systems and, and, and policy uh, change, right? And that requires long-term investments. That is not a quick fix. We can't do that in a three to five a year grant making a, a cycle. And the last thing I will say is uh, this, you know, I was on a call earlier today uh, with one of our leaders uh, uh, in the field um, that is uh, doing some, you know, an amazing national work and uh, the ability for us to have a CEO to CEO conversation and to hear the stress and the challenges of trying to uh, hustle for that next grant and the return, because there's been a lot of talk and a lot of chatter, but the actual dollars in the field, and we get this from our members as well, that it's even harder, it's more competitive. Uh, but I see leaders are uh, uh, stressed. And uh, what I will add, and Travian, get ready, is that what well, we also need to see is a deeper investment in health Healing, healing and wellness in our most recent quantifying hope report. Uh, when we look at targeted investments to black men and boys, um, there was only a 7% 7 uh, of the 104, uh, $107 million went to health, uh, health funding. And, and, and Sean, well, when we talk about the, you, you, you give an excellent point to be able to, to transition into trading. And when you're talking about folks hustling for that next grant, um, as a you know, as someone who who who's leading a, a philanthropic institution in North Carolina, one of the things that I've continually seen is that we reward individuals that tell the worst stories the best about our community. That is very much so from a deficit kind of deficit base. You have to tell the the most egregious stories about the communities that you're serving to be able to get grant dollars, right? Uh, the way that you have to frame the story is as a community is broken as a person is broken, um, as, uh, um, uh, you know, really kind of unloading that, as opposed to really looking at, I think, a system. Um, and, you know, my mom told me, you can, only, you can only treat somebody as good as you talk about them. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about um, what that means uh, as we think about uh, the work that BME is doing uh, with asset framing um, and get it a little bit into uh, pass it off to trade and shorters and thinking about what is that work? What is what, what did you think about the narrative and asset framing? And could you kind of just hop a little bit into about the, the work that you're leading across the country um, to really uplift uh, this model um, as as key uh, to doing this work and, and not further uh, perpetuating inequality? Yeah, totally. Thank you. Um, first of all, I love your mom's expression. That's right. You can only uh, treat people as well as you talk about them. And Sean Dove, uh, I, I, I just love as a, as a leader and a brother, and I respect him tremendously because he was speaking this truth back when it wasn't in vogue. Uh, and I'm not sure it remains in vogue, but he's still speaking this truth. Um, I, look, I'm of the assumption that everybody on this call it actually wants to do the right thing, and you're trying to figure out how and why to invest uh, in black men and boys. And my piece of it is around uh, a common correctable error that we all make that tends to sabotage our attempts at equity um, and tends to make it harder for us to even recognize systemic challenges. And this is a correctable error and it's rooted in our psychology and it has nothing to do with our intentions. And, and I bring that up just to make it clear that those of us who are the good guys, 
make the mistakes that I'm about to describe to you, and you can quiz yourself uh, as I give you sort of the short course in asset framing. So um, asset framing is a concept that BME has promoted, which is simply defining people by their aspirations and contributions. Most of what I'm going to say is going to sound as commonsensical as that, but it's rooted in um, research psychology that is Nobel Prize winning uh, and is literally the world's uh, leading authority and best thinking on how we actually think and make decisions. And at the core of this is a guy named Daniel Kahneman who disproved um, rational choice theory. Rational choice theory is an economic theory based on the idea that human beings, when given two uh, objects, rationally choose whichever one gives them the best benefit. Kahneman proved that we cannot do that. That is not how our minds work. And that's what he won the Nobel Prize for. Now, this particular belief had been the cornerstone of Western thought and economics since the Enlightenment. So I, I'm, I want to lay that down to make, make uh, one thing clear to you. Most of us are still operating out of an assumption that has been disproven about how we actually think, decide, lead, and change. We do not use rational processes. We use narratives. Narratives are how we frame everything that we're going to do and not do is how we frame who we are and who others are. And, and philanthropy, uh, unfortunately, has a habit of deficit framing those whom we want to help. And there are a lot of negative consequences that come with that. Deficit framing is defining someone by their challenge, ignoring their contributions, and remediating them to be less of a burden on society in the present or the future. And if you think about many of our philanthropic missions, that is how we phrase them. Dorian alluded to it. You know, if you're trying to help at-risk youth in high crime neighborhoods to, you know, stay on track and graduate, avoid becoming a negative six, something like that. If you, have, if you have one of those savior crisis oriented narratives then recognize that you are defining these oftentimes children as potential threats to the future society, right? And it turns out that the way our minds work and the way narratives works, when you define someone by their challenge, that is the definition of stigmatizing them. And you can stigmatize someone for good reasons, but the fact of the matter is, if you run me over in the street with your car because you hate me, that's terrible. But if you run me over in the street with your car because you weren't paying attention and you just didn't see me, the effect is the same on me. So it's important that we have a different way of being able to see the people who we want to engage, the people who deserve the opportunities that we're trying to make available to them. And, the, and again, once you stigmatize someone, your brain, the way our brains work is once we form a narrative, we are prone to disregard information that doesn't fit that narrative. So you define a community, and this, this, by the way, goes beyond black people, but let's focus here. When you define anyone by their challenge, and you're defining them as ex-felons or underserved communities or low-income families or any of the language that we like to throw around, you create a narrative around that person, place, uh, or community and our brains are hardwired. We're prone to disregard things that don't fit our narrative. So for instance, many of us who think that we're data-driven, I would challenge you to figure out whether you're data-driven or whether you're negative data-driven. Can you tell the story of you know, what the dropout rates are, what the unemployment rates are, but if someone were to turn around and ask you, well, how many black kids are in college, could you quote that statistic? Or they would ask you how many black people create businesses? Can you quote that statistic? Or are you trying to quote unquote solve problems by looking only at people in the worst possible light? Because the same black male who is considered a derelict father or, or you know, or, or, you know uh, threat to society or, or, or potential criminal or unemployed, all those negative languages around uh, black males as a population, that same brother is the most likely to serve this country in uniform, has been for decades. That same brother is the most engaged father in actively raising their children, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Like, you know, these are not radical sources. Like, the U.S. Army says that black men sign up more than other people, right? Um, the U.S. Department of Commerce says that African Americans have been creating businesses at a rate that's been growing at more than twice the national average for over a decade. This is all part of their true story. So we're not asking anybody to make up anything. We're asking people to try to see a fuller picture of who you're addressing, because if all you have 
is the negative data to ride on, then you're ignoring at least half your opportunities to solve whatever problem it is you think you're trying to challenge. If, if, if you know that uh, a community has high unemployment, but you're ignoring that they have a high entrepreneurship quotient, then your solutions won't do anything to help their businesses stabilize, right? To help them, you know, go from being a sole proprietor to hiring another person and all the multiple benefits that come from that for the individual, for the family, and for the community that gets more stabilized because more people are employed, right? So the, the important thing that I'm trying to share is I believe we're all trying to do the good thing. But it turns out that the latest science shows us that some of our basic assumptions about how to motivate and activate people are wrongheaded. You don't have to define someone by the thing that is the least aggrandizing, least validating experience in life, the thing that they least want to be known for. You don't have to define them by that. And if you find yourself in a situation where you can't speak to the person who you supposedly allied yourself with, you're trying to improve their community, where you can't speak to them using the language uh, to their face that you use in the grant proposals, then you have a problem, right? <laughs> you, you should be able to use the same language to someone's face that you use behind their back. And our idea that we have to use this crisis-oriented uh, negative uh, frame in order to mo motivate people actually has been disproven. One of our clients is Donors Choose, which is a, you know, they're a, um, a crowdfunding platform that funds classroom projects. Donors Choose raises $130 million a year. When we <laughs> worked with them, uh, they switched from having their um, teachers post projects that talked about the, you know, the low-income youth and, and all these things that you know, are meant to uh, jerk tears to talking about this, these kids' aspirations to graduate and to learn about science and to learn about uh, ecology and to learn about tech. And, and the fact that these kids have aspirations they actually ended up raising more money when they spoke of people's aspirations to do more, people's contributions to do more, and then what is in their way? What is preventing these people with worthy aspirations from achieving their objectives? Even if their aspiration is just to work or to feed their family, all these things are things that, folk, that people respect. But when you never mention that a person actually has a worthy aspiration, then you make them the object in the sentence, not the subject of the sentence. And in making them the object in the sentence, not the subject, you know, in making them the thing to be handled and not the person to ally yourself with, it becomes very hard to recognize what systems are keeping this person from achieving their goals. Because deficit framing doesn't establish any character for the people that you're trying to work with. Asset framing requires you to assert their character at the very beginning. And when you've made it clear that you have hardworking men uh, who are committed to serving their country, who are committed to their children, but yet their children are still the most impoverished, then you ask a better question. Why is it that the children of men who are hardworking, committed, enterprising, and patriotic, why are their children experiencing the highest rates of poverty? That's when it becomes easier to ask what the obstacle is. Like, there are systemic challenges. It's such a, uh, you know, worthy or uh, person can't achieve their admirable goals. So that's what asset framing is about. Asset framing is, is about defining people honestly, telling the full picture, because once you present the full picture, you ask better questions. Beanie's experience with yeah. this, and I'll, I'll wrap with this. I'll wrap up with this. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, brother. No, sir, I, I wanted to actually, and maybe this is where you were getting ready to go. Um, I was I was in a conversation with one of my uh one of my colleagues in philanthropy um, and uh, her comment was, you know, I just, it's hard for me to find leadership in the community. Now, I, my, my feeling about that is that, you know, she's not proximate to community. And so you can yeah. throw a rock uh, in any direction and hit a leader yep. uh, in, a, in a black community. Um, yep. And so I feel like you, you would have something to say a little bit about that. Could you talk a little bit about BME and the, the, the thousands of, of black males sure. that you're working with across the country um, quickly yep. um, from how yep. to with Anthony, but I'll, I'll I think take, it's important. I'll, to, I'll to, take to, 60 to, seconds. To, 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 yep. Yeah, I'll take 60 seconds. Um, so uh, BME offers fellowships for black men who are giving back to the community in all different ways. But we also have a network of about 40,000 subscribers who follow our work and, and are engaged in our communities around these asset-based narratives about communities and about people. Uh, one example, and I, like I said, I can do this in 30 seconds, 
we have probably, I don't know, a dozen or so brothers, fellows who have serious criminal past, but we never define them as ex-felons. We define them the way they define themselves, as writers, as teachers, as community organizers, as people trying to give back. And then we expose them opportunities for those kinds of people. And our guys have had incredible success because they've been allowed to be who they aspire to be. And I mean, when I say incredible, I mean from I was in prison five years ago to I've been on Oprah, I've written a bestseller. And by the way, uh, the bestseller stuff is more than one person. Uh, they're leading national organizations. They're just killing it because we allowed them to be who they aspire to be. No deficit frame narrative will ever get you there. And that's how we sabotage ourselves. No, thank you. I want to take a, uh, well, we're going to go into an outside of audience questions. Yes, Dorian, thank you. Uh, we're going to our next uh, polling question. And the question is, what is your experience with asset framing? And kind of the, the response I think that is gaining, um, that is that is getting more traction is, I have heard of it, but I could use some guidance. And I think that makes sense given the context of this webinar as well. Uh, followed by, it is a primary component of our work. 23% of, of our audience has uh, chosen that as their response. All right, so we're at 66% of our audience participating. I'm going to now close the poll and you should be able to, um, uh, let's see here, I've closed the poll, I'm gonna share the responses and now you should be able to see the response uh, in your on your screen. So again, we have um, a total of 53% chose. I have heard of it, but I could use some guidance, followed by it is a primary component of our work, and then uh, none, 18%, and then 8% indicating that they're not sure. Dorian, what are your thoughts on the responses? So I, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not surprised. Um, you know, I, I even uh, as someone who's, who's been in the nonprofit space, um, being guilty of framing my own communities um, uh, in, in, in similar ways. But I think once you know, you have an obligation to do better. And so I would strongly recommend that you'll, you guys will see the information out of, uh, at the end of this to bring Brian, Sean, Travian, Anthony, um, uh, Tanya Allen, and the folks that, uh, that Sean mentioned to come and speak to you. Um, to come to think about, you know, how can we make these institutional changes that we need to do um, in terms of being able to serve our system? Um, you know, when you have folks that have kind of heard of it or have had some guidance, and that's over half of that's over half uh, of the folks that are on this call. These are also the folks that are making the decisions for our community. They're making decisions around how dollars are allocated and where money is spent. Um, and so we need to be very vigilant about our own gaps and our own organizational gaps, being able to be honest about those. Um, and thinking about how do we take this information, uh, go back to our organizations, go back to the way that we do our work and do it differently. Um, because if not, then we're only further uh, perpetuating, um, uh, perpetuating inequality uh, through, uh, through our daily work. So I want to move over to... Um, to talk a little bit with uh, Anthony Smith, the CEO of Cities United. Um, Anthony works with 130 mayors across the country uh, to really think about how to build uh, safe and healthy communities uh, for all of us, uh, but has an emphasis on uh, black males. I think the work that Anthony does is particularly um, uh, significant and important um, because it's talking about creating institutionalized change uh, within our city and local government. Uh, this is where people live, this is where place happens, um, this is where people's homes are located. And so we're looking about something that's very tangible. I think Anthony's work is very tangible. Um, uh, and so I want to talk a little bit, uh, if Anthony could talk a little bit about the work that he's doing in Louisville and beyond um, uh, and hop in, uh, hop in now. Yeah. Thank you, Dorian. And I appreciate that. And uh, always honored to be on the call with Brian, uh, Sean, and Trabian and uh, always amazed at their work. I uh, really want to thank Trabian for that last, uh, for framing the way he did and really start that question around when you start thinking about folks from their asset phrase, your questions are different. And you start really thinking about systems and how systems uh, impede folks from uh, uh, being safe, healthy, and hopeful, and how we've got to look at the historical framework of the work that we've been doing. Uh, so as Dorian said, Cities United spends a lot of time in mayor's offices, really helping mayors and their teams 
have a different kind of a way of working with communities, really working with communities on creating what we call public safety, comprehensive public safety plans, really looking beyond law enforcement and really looking upstream, looking at prevention and intervention and really thinking about how we reallocate our dollars. Uh, as uh, Sean said, we can't rely just on philanthropy. We've also got to reallocate uh, the way cities think about their budgets, the way the school systems think about their budgets, and then how does all of that play uh, in making sure that we're creating communities that are safe, healthy, and hopeful for all of our young folks. I also want to say that as when we think about this investment in Black men and boys, that we think about who they're with, right? So we, we uh, uh, Brian talked about we spend a lot of money on programmatic, and we've got to think beyond that. We've got to think about these young men and think about our investments as a two to three generational approach, right? Thinking about who these young men live with, whether it's their mom, dad, parents, grandparents, and then also who are they raising? A lot of the young men that we're talking about, a good number of the young men that we're talking about are also raising kids. So when we think about our investment, it's not just about that young person who's sitting in front of you, but it's about the young, it's about who they're with as well. And I think so when you ask the question around investment and how does it impact the whole community health, I think we've got to start thinking about not just the individual in front of us, but that whole community as a whole, and really putting our resources and our, and our time and energy and uh, looking at the issues around housing, looking at issues around uh, investment in jobs, and how do we get, how do we move folks around the community so that they can work uh, in, in livable wage jobs and really make a difference in their communities and their families. Uh, so think about it that way. And what Cities United really focuses on is really helping mayors have that big picture and really think long term around how do we get to a place where all of our young people are, are able to live out their aspirations and their dreams and what does that look like and feel like for communities uh, we spend a lot of time in a number of communities really trying to incubate a couple of things so then we can take them on a national level uh, we're doing some work in buffalo really helping buffalo identify young uh, men and boys of color uh, between ages of 14 and 24 who are now taking part of, their, they identified 100 young men who really are helping them think about their policy agenda this on a citywide level. Uh, so they spend time with the mayor, the superintendent, and others really focused in on thinking about what is it that young people need to succeed and how do you, how do you build a youth adult partnership so young people are at the center of that conversation? And especially the young men who are most impacted by some of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, and letting them help guide the work. Uh, we did that in partnership with the mayor's office and then also the foundation, the community foundation in Buffalo, really spending time helping them think through what a process would look like and how do you allow these young men to help lead the work in a way that's uh, authentic for them and that we're really listening and partnering with them and leading the work. Uh, and so as we're building that out, it's called break and, uh, Breaking Barriers and, uh, and it's really an organization and they've turned it into this whole model around, you, you know, they, they are really moving uh, at a pace where young people get to sit at the table uh, and not try to do work ahead of them, but really make sure that they're working in partnership with them. Uh, so that's a model that we're looking at and thinking about as you, as you think about young people and as you think about how they move in the world, you got to create leadership opportunities for them or at least get out of the way so that they can create their own uh, and making sure that we are investing in their growth and in their development. Uh, and that's not just in the classroom, it's also in the community. And it's also making sure that we are creating the next generation of young folks who want to help lead their city, their countries and the world. Uh, but there, are, you know, Dorian highlighted, uh, asked about some work that we're doing here in Louisville. Uh, and a lot of that has uh, really been around uh, working in partnership with the mayor, working in partnership with some of the local foundations and then also some national foundations, Keenan. And when you think about Louisville, when you think about Black Middle Achievement, understand that Louisville has been, uh, in a partnership with Sean, has been deemed the Epic Center for Black Middle Achievement. Uh, and when you think about three of the organizations that focus strictly on Black males and Black men achievement, Black Middle Achievement, you've got all of us have a heavy footprint in there. You think about uh, Cities United, uh, the Campaign for Black Middle Achievement, and then Be Me. All three of us spend significant amount of time and resources in that city really helping to develop and, and, and incubate what we believe could be a, a model for across the country. So we spend time thinking about how do you build the leaders? How do you support the leaders? How do you give them the resources that they need to really move the work? Uh, one of the projects that we're working on right now, and it's an initiative that we believe has a, as a, as a way to really think about how do you invest in a community without displacement? And how do you really set the foundation for those community members who have been in the neighborhood that have experienced 
redlining, that have experienced other systematic racial uh, racism that has kind of like really destroyed their community in a way where uh, or disconnected their community from resources. I wouldn't say destroyed the community, but disconnected it from resources. Uh, one of the, uh, well, there used to be a street in Louisville called Walnut Street, and it was considered the uh, uh, Harlem of the South. That's where all of the businesses were. That's where all of the black wealth was being created. And it's in the middle of this neighborhood, Russell neighborhood that we're looking at. Uh, and and when redlining came through and uh, uh, urban renewal, it destroyed that community and really disconnected it from the rest of the city uh, and, uh, and really made it a place where uh, disinvestment started happening in those communities, lost its foundation. Uh, so we're in the process of working in partnership with the community and really thinking about this investment uh, without displacement and what would it look like to really help uh, or really support and work with families and community to build home ownership uh, as a foundation for wealth building, uh, businesses, uh, entrepreneurship, as Trey being talked about, and how do you create this engine where we see this neighborhood that right is on the cusp of the downtown, like two blocks away from downtown Louisville, that if we don't get ahead of the investment uh, or get ahead of gentrification, a lot of those families will be displaced. So working in partnership with the mayor, working in partnership with local and national foundations, but more importantly, working in partnership with the community to really build uh, what does this system looks like? Who do we want to invest? How do we want folks to invest in our communities? What does it look like for us in the community to be part owners or owners of this investment as they come in and how do we all work in partnership? So you're really thinking about and being strategic and intentional around black wealth building in this community uh, and beyond so that we can really build out a strategy and, and, and a model that folks can then look at and say, how do we do this across the country and how do we support uh, black wealth building uh, from the foundation and giving folks the tools and resources that they need uh, and to really move the needle. And looking at sometimes uh, if philanthropy could be risk investment, coming in and really putting up dollars to really get the engine started and moving uh, and really help push the, uh, push the needle. Uh, one of the reasons this neighborhood is super important to us is there's a, about a billion dollars of investment happening in and around it. Uh, there's a, our local urban league in Louisville is going to be building a sports complex uh, that's on a, a 24 acre lot. There's going to be a, a center that's going to be grounded in an indoor outdoor track uh, and has been getting a lot of traction around that. There's a number of big other uh, movement. Uh, it's also a choice neighborhood. So you can, one of the last housing projects in the, commu in the, in the city would be torn down and mixed income housing is coming. So there's a lot of energy happening. But then there's also a lot of people knocking on doors uh, of the of the caring homeowners asking to buy their houses and trying to get them to sell. And we're trying to get them to hold on because investors outside of the community see the value. And we're trying to get them to see the value now so that they can stay put and really elevate their process. Uh, and, you know, for Cities United, again, we are really trying to help mayors build a different model of how they move a city. you got to bring million. Uh, multiple people to the table to really think uh, comprehensively about what cities and communities are going through. So we ask mayors to build a big table and a big bench where they have uh, a community voice, philanthropy voice, a business, uh, nonprofit, the faith base, and really think holistically around how do we uh, advance and identify the key solutions to some of the issues cities are facing. But also, I think the key thing I want to make sure I highlight is that we're also asking cities to rethink of how they allocate their budget. Uh, most cities spend anywhere between 30 and 80 percent of their annual budget on public safety. And we believe that if you thought about that differently and you did more prevention and more upstream work, you could have a different outcome. And then you can start to disinvest inside of police and other public safety issues because you wouldn't need them as much because you're investing in your community early uh, and upfront. So really thinking about the budget and how that looks, but then also how do you create partners and partnerships with philanthropy to really move the needle and move the agenda. So we're really focused on that. And the last thing I'll say is that also in Louisville, uh, we're working on a, what we're calling civic engagement fellowships. Again, that's a partnership with, uh, with the city. Uh, we're doing this in Louisville and Lexington, both in Kentucky, but it's a partnership between uh, the city, Keenan and Cities United. And we're really focused in on how do you how do you build a pipeline uh, and get folks ready for the next generation of public servants? Uh, folks who really want to go inside of their city government, work inside of city government, 
but not just work, but also lead uh, the charge and really think about policy level uh, solutions and issues. Uh, we're identifying young men between ages of 22 and 26. Uh, these young men have had some uh, uh, connection to the criminal justice system. Some of them are just coming out of jail. Some of, uh, but these young men are really engaged in a 24 month process where they will be working in partnership inside the city departments and really helping to move the needle uh, and and, uh, and think about what that looks like. And we're really excited about that uh, and see that we can have uh, a, a new face or a new landscape of young leaders who are really thinking about how their city move and operate in a way that yep. folks never look at before. Go ahead, Dory. Yeah. No, I'm just going to say that's awesome. I think one of the things that you really bring up that I think highlights is uh, around the budget, the budget piece. I think there's often a misconception that uh, the money is not there or the money is not out there uh, or we're constrained in resources. Uh, well, I think the argument needs to be more so around we need to rethink about how we how we reallocate our dollars to more effectively spend uh, on our communities in ways that we know that we're going to be successful. Um, you know, we 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 find uh, we find it in our budget to incarcerate in the warehouse uh, some of our most valuable talent in our black males. We should be able to find it in our budget to think about how we uh, invest in their education, uh, invest in their economic security, invest in their health um, uh, as uh, before we get into that space uh, and before we continue to put people in survival mode. So I really appreciate you uh, you, you highlighting the work that Cities United is doing for us. Um, I'll hop in uh, for just a minute uh, and talk a little bit about Paid in Full, uh, which uh, was a, a article uh, Dr. Brian Barnes and I wrote um, uh, earlier this year, uh, and is really thinking about how you make paid in full investments within, uh, within communities of color. One of the real precursors to this is one, um, being able to know your history, uh, being able to understand, um, that you can't talk about wealth development and economic development and education, uh, within these communities without understanding, uh, the context by which, um, and the history by which these communities sit in. Right. So if you're going to talk about housing, you have to be familiar with redlining. If you're going to talk about education, you have to talk about busing and you have to talk about integration. You have to talk about all of those things that I think systems have um, have really unloaded on our communities in ways that disenfranchise them in really intentional ways. Um, and you also uh, and being able to know your history, you also need to know your present uh, and understanding that this is not uh, just something that used to happen. These are things that currently happen. Um, uh, when you turn on the news, look at how black males are portrayed, look at how black communities are portrayed. When you go into the office, look at what conversations people are willing to have and what conversations people are not willing to have. Um, so be really clear about the history. Um, and if you're not clear about the history, you can fool yourself into believing that communities are inherently deficient, um, as opposed to systems have very intentionally created ways to disenfranchise uh, a specific group of people. Uh, the second is around proximity. Um, you, if, if, you're, if you're not in the communities that you're serving um, and you're not spending time uh, getting an opportunity to understand the assets that are there and being able to build with uh, the people that are there um, uh, uh, and being able to understand the genius that is there, um, then uh, you cannot, you can only do your job, but so effectively, um, you know, so proximity matters, uh, being on the ground matters. Um, and so the paid in full investment strategy is really a push to say, we can't just make singular investments in a silver bullet type of way and expect uh, for systems to change or for us to have dramatic impacts on the way that communities are um, uh, and for us to try to see the type of impact that we want to see. And I use this, this, this kind of story in terms of thinking about your own family. Um, you go home and you place your bets on your family. You bet on your education. You bet on your housing. You bet on your health care. You bet on um, uh, the justice system to keep you safe. You bet on all these things to make sure that your kids and your family is able to thrive. It's not just one thing. I think in philanthropy, what we tend to do is to try to make these silver bullet bets or silver bullet approaches and saying, okay, I'm going to invest in third grade reading scores um, because that is going to change and fix poverty. That is going to change and fix the situations that folks are in. Um, and while you might see some growth, 
um, it is not the same type of investment that you would see in uh, and that you make daily in your in your family. Um, but when somebody's in a different economic situation, we tend to think these silver bullet approaches will necessarily work for them. And I'm not saying that it's, it's not beneficial to have uh, a niche expertise. What I'm saying is that we need the if the issues uh, or opportunities that occur within our communities don't happen in isolation, so the solutions can happen in isolation. Uh, you can't have a partial investment and have uh, and expect to see a a, a, a whole outcome. Um, and so uh, I want to stop there um, because I want to leave room for uh, time for questions and for us to be able to interact with the audience. Uh, but I would say take those things and the things that you've heard today and be really intentional about how you put them into practice tomorrow. Um, you know, you can talk about somebody different tomorrow. You can talk about somebody different in, in the next hour. Uh, you can think about how you invest your dollars. You can think about your work uh, differently uh, as you walk away from this conversation. So I would just would urge you to think about how it plays out in practice um, in your daily uh, in your daily life, uh, how it plays out in practice in your organization. Um, uh, you cannot have uh, a situation where you think of equity as an add-on. It has to be a full investment. And it has to be paid in full. Um, so I'll stop there uh, and we'll open up the uh, pass it back over to our foundation center colleagues uh, to open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Dorian, for those closing remarks. And thank you again to all of our panelists, to Brian, Sean, Travian and Anthony for those that amazing presentation. I was I, I couldn't help myself, but I was copiously taking notes on a lot of things that you all said that rang so true. Um, Travian, I, 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 if you're ever if you ever teach a class at a at a college at a local university, please let me know. I'd love to sit in on one of your lectures. Um, I I really enjoyed what you had to say. So we're going to now begin answering questions submitted during today's presentation. And our first question um, is uh, for Travian. Actually, uh, we have uh, uh, Marieva and Tammy. Uh, are asking, uh, please give more advice to grant writers of color to find this positive data to build empowering grants for boys and young men of color. How do we write successful grant proposals without highlighting the negative when funders look for those things to establish need and identify where their funds can make the most impact? Um, and as our presenters consider their response, um, I'd like to make you aware of two special opportunities um, that are part of our DEI webinar series. Uh, next month, Muhi Kwaha and Safa Ibrahim of the American Muslim Fund will discuss how to position your charity to take a lead in promoting cross-cultural and interreligious avenues to enhance your outreach. Uh, you'll learn how to develop a plan of action to engage your local Muslim community. Uh, claim uh, You can claim your spot early by um, registering uh, through the link that we provide. You can also just go to grantspace.org and register there. Um, and don't forget that if you cannot attend any of our live webinars, you will also uh, you will always get the recording so you can watch it on your own time. Uh, and if you want to catch up with the conversation, we recommend starting with our recorded webinars, uh, getting ahead of the curve with diversity, inclusion, and equity that was delivered by Carly Hare, who's the National Director of Change Philanthropy. And she discusses how nonprofit organizations can proactively address the issues of diversity, inclusion, and equity within their organization in a way that generates positive and transformative change. And you can find all of this in our racial equity portal um, that Elizabeth will be sharing with all of you shortly through the chat. Um, and with that, I would like to return to our question again from Marieva and Tammy. Uh, so again, uh, Trevian, just to reiterate, uh, they're asking, so how can you write a successful grant proposal without highlighting the negative data when sometimes funders look for those things to establish need and identify where their funds can make the most impact? Yeah, no, great question. Um, and it's not about ignoring the negatives. It's about not defining people by the negatives. So you can mention all the terrible conditions and threats and challenges, but you can't shorthand it as at-risk youth or high crime community. If you describe or you define a person or place by their aspiration or contribution, and then you point out that they have to deal with uh, limited resources, uh, threatening environments, uh, lack of institutional support. When you, when, you, when, you, when you tell the story that way, then we understand that the 
person that you're working with has some aspirations and has some value to the society, legitimate value to society, and that there are obstacles in the way. So um, a very common mistake uh, when people are trying to would do what they call asset framing is they use positive language. Positive language is not asset framing. Positive language is spin, right? Your your brain knows that the ghetto became the inner city, you know, became the urban center. Like your brain makes those translations. Like right? you, you 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 can't you can't call poor people differently wealthy and get away with it. Like the what is more important is don't define them by their challenge at all. Define define them by their aspiration, and then you can list the challenges that are blocking their aspiration, and it tells a much more compelling story. America loves an underdog. So when you describe someone who, who you know, has good aspirations, good contributions, but they're being thwarted all these different ways, people invest, people invest in that. Um, that was a great response, Travian. Thank you so much. Uh, before we move on to our next question, I just want to uh, give a quick shout out to some of the people uh, that – responded to our first question, which is, you know, who are you? Where are you joining us from? Uh, we have folks uh, joining us from uh, Richmond, California, uh, funding ex founding executive director of uh, Rich City Rides. Uh, we also have Fords from Georgia, in fact, Ford Valley, Georgia, uh, from Kansas City, I am making foundation.org. Uh, we also have folks from DC um, and from Denver, Colorado. So to all of you who responded, thank you so much for joining us. Um, the next question is uh, from Ron. Uh, if we see this time in the movement as a crossing, uh, as a crossing, the Rubicon moment, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna just read that one more time. If we see this time in the movement, in the movement as crossing the Rubicon moment, with the reality that the philanthropic status quo shifts its priorities from investment in black men and boys, what's at stake if we fail to make a timely shift to our own talent and resources? Would anyone, uh, Dorian or anyone else like to take that question? Um, I, would, I would say, uh, one, first and foremost, I think the soul of our country. Um, you know, when I think through, uh, you'll hear a lot that, you know, when, when you go or with every crazy comment, uh, you turn on the news or walk outside and people will say, well, that's not who we are as Americans. That's not who we are. I would argue to say that that's who we are. Um, and it's not, but it's not who we aspire to be. It's not who we can be. Um, if we continue down this path, I think it's a very dangerous road um, uh, where you continue to, to, um, put people in survival mode or you put them in a fishbowl and force them to fight for resources. Uh, and I would say that, um, you know, when we make the moral trade-off uh, to maintain privilege and uh, to keep uh, an entire race of individuals down, then folks will continually make the, the mandatory choice to make a moral trade-off to survive. Um, people are going to find ways to feed their family. They're going to find ways to, uh, to, to make ends meet. Um, uh, and that's going to have very real consequences um, uh, and has very real consequences now. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything to that. You said it very succinctly, Dorian. Nothing to add. All right. Uh, our next question here is from uh, Angel. Uh, how do we invest in the black community without displacing it? Do, uh, do you have any thoughts on how this can be done effectively? Oh, this is Anthony. Go ahead, Dorian. Yes. No, go ahead, you got it. Yeah, so this is Anthony, and I think, again, it's, uh, it's about being in partnership with community. And really working in partnership and making sure that the investments are are, are led by the community. So really making sure that you spend time uh, in those communities, in those black neighborhoods, uh, and work in partnership with them, uh, and think about the investments that they would like to see. Uh, when I talked about Russell, a place of promise, right? Right now we're in the process of really spending time in and with community, thinking about what's already there. Because uh, if you look in those communities, there's already businesses and and opportunities happen. Uh, and how do you secure those, make sure that those folks are have what they need and what they need to survive? 
Uh, but then also just spending a lot of time in community and, and, and slowing our process down and spending time with the folks in the community really thinking through the process. Uh, but I think as you heard Travian say, there's already things happening. First, finding out that, support that, and then let's build from there. Uh, but I think also when you think about uh, investment without displacement in the community, making sure that as you build homeowners and you, you're building up who's living there and uh, who's building, that you start with the folks who are already there making sure that they can become homeowners, making sure that they are owning some of the land and the property uh, in the process and really making sure that you're creating an environment where they uh, are, are, are able to take advantage of all those opportunities that are coming along. Uh, but it all starts yeah. in, in relationship with community. Yeah, and I think it goes back to also, Anthony, to add on that too, it goes back to something that, that Brian said earlier in this conversation is that we need to really think very deeply about outcomes-based investment. Um, and really think beyond programs, right? Um, if we're if we're in philanthropy, one of our you know kind of our issues, and you'll see that I'm very critical of it, is that we'll we'll we're very comfortable with funding programs for 10, 20, 30 years um, that focus on one specific thing. Um, when we need to be trying to make those investments around individuals, not just on programs, but on individuals to own their own homes, on individuals to own their own businesses. Um, uh, on individuals to, to really think about wealth creation and mobility. Um, because that gets to an investment that's most, more justice oriented as opposed to one that's really charity oriented. Um, uh, and gets to the point where you're bringing people back into right standing. Um, uh, and so think beyond your traditional investments. Um, think about how you're making sure that folks own things. Um, uh, and that you're, you're really thinking about it across generations. Um, and get away, I, I think, uh, from just a, a traditional program investment type of model. And, and this is Sean, and the thing I would add to that is that I think Dorian exemplifies this and a number of our colleagues in philanthropy. Uh, I think it really starts with uh, intention and will. Uh, and the attention has to be about building community and developing the existing uh, assets. Uh, but I think within uh, philanthropy that folks that are at the table, uh, in the board meetings, with the trustees, uh, have to uh, take the risk of uh, uh, radical imagination and, and sharing a different vision around building community without displacing uh, the, the residents. And uh, and that's a ongoing thing. You gotta keep on, uh, you know, being the person and the leaders and uh, partnering with others at other foundations uh, so it's not a sole voice. Right. Thank one you so thing. much. Oh yes, go ahead. This is Anthony, I'll add one more. And I think also, uh, and I think, I, I can't remember who said it, but also think about those organizations that are already doing the work that are led by black folks in those communities. How do you support them and invest in them too, right? So when we think about this investment on black business, making sure that the organizations that have been there doing the work who have the trust of the community, have the resources they need. Um, can, I, can I please ask again if you can mute yourselves if you're not uh, speaking, just so that we don't get the bra uh, background noise. Thank you so much. And thank you, Anthony, for your, for your remarks. Um, the next question is from Amy, and Amy is asking, how can we position ourselves to have this conversation with local government officials? Uh, being a nonprofit that focuses on identity development, how can we keep this conversation going? Everything discussed today is relevant to our initiatives here in Atlanta. So she's uh, joining us from Atlanta, especially the data and reports that were shared. Any thoughts on that? So this is Anthony. I think the way when I think about it, government works for us. Uh, so at any given time, we should be able to invest in and get them to invest in the conversation with us. Uh, I think your for local philanthropy, your local nonprofits could always convene local elected officials to really talk through uh, the, the work. Uh, and I know Sean Trabian and uh, the folks on this call would be willing to come in and help have that conversation. Uh, uh, you know, if we depending on how it all flows, but I think always start with the government and elected officials work for us. So if we start the conversation conversation that way and ask them to come to our table. There's a different conversation that we can have. 
uh, uh, with the with our local governments. And I think that's how you continue that conversation. Yes, it's Trey. And I'd like that. to add that. Oh, uh, go ahead, Trey. I'll, I'll be quick. I, yeah, I just wanted to add that um, it also it's also helpful to come to them with an offering rather than always with an ask, right? Um, I I haven't met any politicians yet who don't like for people to be positively engaged with their brand, and so helping people to understand, helping them to understand that you can actually spur that engagement. Back when Be Me first formed, we were working in Philadelphia. And Mayor Nutter, who was, you know, instrumental um, in Cities United in the beginning, used to constantly refer to the stories that Me shared as stories about Philadelphians making a better Philadelphia. But our stories were all about the contributions that Black men were making. And it fit Nutter's narrative and Nutter's brand to talk up how all Philadelphians are leaning in, including these Black men, right? And when you tell the story of the whole city, the the uh, you know the elected officials get to be representatives of the whole city, and they have reason to believe in them. And, and this is Sean. I just wanted to uh, add to what Trabian um, just shared. Uh, I think the importance of and while this conversation certainly is um, centered on black men and boys, uh, the importance of coalition building and network building uh, in your local communities in approaching uh, city government uh, as a united front. And, you know, black women and girls, LGBT community, uh, immigrant rights community, there are opportunities to uh, coalesce uh, and form coalitions and approach city government as a united front um, without uh, losing your focus in the area that you are trying to advance. This is uh, this is Brian. I want to just sort of build on these comments. I, I think part of the conversation uh, that must be highlighted, and you know, having you know, when interacting with government and, and other organizations, is to go beyond the moral mandate uh, and to go to the question of you know how how is how are the outcomes now? Um, how is it working for you to do business as usual? We look at most of our urban centers and cities. When you look at education, you look at health, you look at workforce development, um, while there are some spurts here and there of success, overall we can't say that people are successful. So then the question becomes, where is room uh, in partnership for uh, try taking new approaches, being innovative, uh, measuring and testing and, 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 and finding new ways to get outcomes? And so part of the conversation, uh, you know, about about coming to the table, bringing something is to be a partner in learning and testing uh, uh, different approaches to get different outcomes because we can all agree that heretofore we have not been wholly successful um, from government down in, in, in the outcomes that we're seeking. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Brian. A follow-up question to, to Amy's question is, how can how can grassroots organizations in, in local communities get community foundations more engaged? Do you have any uh, recommendations on how to begin knocking on those doors um, and, and get the conversation started there? Uh, so, so this is Sean, and um, I will, a um, couple things in that uh, vein, and I will build on what Trabian uh, first shared is, uh, Look, you all are on this webinar, you are the experts in your uh, community. And so, so number one, I would say, be a resource uh, before uh, asking for uh, resources. Um, number two, we all know that relationships are uh, vital to uh, philanthropic investments and being able to do your homework and find out what the goals are of the community foundation and come to them with uh, solutions, right? And how they can reach uh, uh, their goals. Uh, the other is being real clear, um, and, and this is to the outcomes uh, point that Brian just uh, brought up, is being able to demonstrate, here is some ROI for your investment um, and we are beginning to see more community foundations. Uh, I think the Executive Alliance have begun to get uh, more community foundations, but it's really a scant number. And so having a specific uh, strategy that involves building relationships uh, with individuals, and it may not necessarily be the folks that are on the staff, it may be board members, it may be other uh, uh, partners, it may be 
folks in city government that have relationships with the uh, community uh, foundations, but certainly lead with the value uh, that you have to offer as an organization and, and what you're doing. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Sean, I would, yes. I would add to that just quickly that, you know, the community foundations, um, one of their primary, uh, the resources that they have is that they have, they have those deep networks within, um, deep networks and for specific populations in, in, your, in your community um, because of the nature of how most community foundations are set up. And so being able to have them and utilize them as a convener to have these conversations, but not only kind of move these courageous, to courageous action, um, uh, but their use as a convener, um, uh, I think that there's real utility there uh, and being able to, uh, to address them in that way. Wonderful. Um, so we are out of time. It's 3.31 p.m. Um, and um, so I just want to uh, point out one more thing. We do have uh, Tam uh, Tamara on the line, and uh, she is uh, sending a shout out to all of you, Sean, Travian, uh, Dorian, and Anthony. Uh, she's uh, tuning in from Oakland, um, thought the presentation was great, and she did have one uh, question, and we'll be closing with her question. Um, her question is for Travian and Sean about this asset framing and pushing philanthropy to disabuse themselves from resourcing efforts that disparage or try to fix, uh, uh, in quotes, uh, black folks. Uh, the risk to nonprofits seem too great, especially since it is about challenging, encouraging, compelling us to force a shift in institutional culture. I'm game, but can you share more resources, scholarships, and strategies? So sure. and Sean, I'll go first because Sean, I, I don't want to go after Sean. Um, I would uh, I would say uh, I, I totally get how you're thinking about it, but I've been on all sides of the philanthropy question as a, as a grant maker and, and grant seeker. And I've always found that when you can come uh, at a foundation with something that is actually innovative, like when you have a way of tackling the problem that's actually different from how everybody else does, you'll at least get their attention, right? So it doesn't have to be about wagging your finger at them and telling them that they're wrong because to be honest we all make this mistake in, in you know nonprofits as well as, as as funders so um i actually look at asset framing as a way to get uh, greater uh, investment and to get greater engagement and i'll give you um one simple example be me our mission statement is to build more caring and prosperous communities inspired by black men there is no quote unquote problem statement in that We've been funded by, you know, a lot of great foundations, including Open Society and Behind the Endowment and, you know, um, re reputable brands. And we teach foundations how they can do asset framing. So no one has taken offense at this new approach or this, this, this better approach for engaging our folks and hitting the, the objectives that we uh, seek. You can come to our website to find out more. There's also a group called um, American Aspirations that Ford Foundation funded. The Frameworks Institute um, does a lot of framing uh, exercises and, and, and has a lot of great tools around that. Um, those are some resources. Yeah, and I really don't have much to uh, offer beyond with Trabian. I didn't want to go after him. Uh, but a couple of tangible uh, recommendations that you can do, actually, a uh, question is um, ask the foundation to uh, host a lunch and learn. Uh, within the foundation where uh, you and or uh, bringing in uh, individuals like a Trabian Shorters to begin to talk about the value of asset framing and how philanthropy, because there are a number of foundations, and I think it would be uh, helpful and, and you can get the list of other foundation foundations who have begun to make the shift. Then I think you should also uh, use uh, communications and begin to uh, write blogs and begin to be the megaphone from your particular platform, uh, uh, challenging philanthropy, invite not challenge, inviting philanthropy to uh, shift its uh, uh, framework and its uh, uh, narrative around uh, deficit uh, investments. There's growing evidence, and uh, you know. Bring, bring Trabian in. 
Thank you so much for that. And if there are no other final uh, remarks from any of our panelists, um, we will uh, end our conversation here. Uh, we also encourage you to continue visiting Foundation Center's Racial Equity Portal, which is home for all of our uh, racial equity and DEI resources produced by Foundation Center. Um, and on behalf of Foundation Center, I want to thank, uh, deeply thank uh, Dorian, Brian, Sean, Trabian, and Anthony uh, for your remarkable presentation, a very inspiring presentation today. Uh, and to everyone who attended today's webinar, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, if you like this webinar, we hope that you will join us again soon. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Thank you again, everyone.